Hey, what's going on CISSP wannabes? Welcome back once again. These are the IT Dojo CISSP practice questions of the day. I'm Colin Weaver and every single day I'm gonna ask you two questions to help you as you continue your CISSP studies. Let's go ahead and get right to it. All right, my first question today coming at you. Which of these, and I want you to pick three, are characteristics of the information security model that we call Brewer and Nash? Go ahead and give those a read. When you're ready, click play and we can talk it through. All right, first two answer choices on the list. Uh, first one is no read up, second one is no write down. Neither of those is correct. Those two particular rules are associated with the uh, Bell Lapadula or Bell Lapadula model. Okay, those are specifically geared towards preserving the confidentiality of information. So, no, neither of those are correct. Next answer choice Brewer Nash is also called the Chinese Wall. That is true. That's absolutely the name that is most commonly associated with it. Next answer choice says that it calls for dynamically changing permissions. This is true. Okay, and this is one of the more interesting little caveats to how the Chinese wall is supposed to work. But yes, the permissions would need to be able to change dynamically based upon things that have taken place. Let me explain more in a moment. Next answer choice on the list says that it's designed to prevent conflicts of interest. And this is also true. This is sort of one of the key sort of, I guess, selling points, if you will, of the Chinese wall is that it allows you to have conflict of interest prevention or avoidance or at the very least mitigation in an environment. Again, I'll explain more in a second. The last two answer choices um, are actually associated with the BIBA or BIBA model, uh, B-I-B-A, uh, which are um, no write up and no read down. Uh, these two, which if you look at them, appear to be the exact opposite of what the top two answer choices are, because they are, are specifically geared towards the idea of preserving the integrity of information. Bell Lapadula is associated with the idea of preserving the confidentiality of information, whereas Biba or Biba are associated with the idea of preserving the integrity of information. Um, neither of those matters That's for this question because they're just there to distract you right now. Our focus is on the Chinese wall. The whole idea of the Chinese wall is this, that it's, it's very much typically associated with and discussed in the context of companies that perform, say, financial consulting services for a lot of other companies. So like a, a brokerage house or something like that, who's going to go in and potentially have access to a lot of what would be categorized as insider information for a variety of different companies. Because the people who work for these different companies deal with a lot of different types of information from different companies, there's a capacity for conflicts of interest to arise when you have access to information from company A that could have an impact on your, say, decisions in the things that you do with company B. So in order to do that, the way that the Chinese, mall, Chinese, mall, <laughs> Chinese wall model is designed is first and foremost, we can go in and say that there's really a few things that are of interest to us. One, there are uh, subjects, there are users, uh, there's going to be the concept of principles, uh, then there's going to be uh, objects, and then we have something called a company data set and something called a, a, a conflict of interest class. Now, what we do is we take all of the objects that pertain to one particular company, which in, for our example is just files, so files that contain information that if somebody were to be able to view them, it could create a conflict of interest scenario. So we bundle all that stuff together in a company data set. And so if we were looking at this from, from a banking perspective, we could go in and say that this company data set is Bank of America, which is all the information relating to the objects, the files for Bank of America. And then there's another company data set over here for, say, Citibank. So you have two different company data sets, but they're both in related industries. They're both in the banking industry. So because both of these company data sets and the data within them, the objects within them are in the same industry, we say that they are in the same conflict of interest class. Now, if you, a user, okay, who is typically gonna be associated, or I'd like to say is gonna be associated as a principal on the system, meaning you have a particular context in which you're going to interact with this information, um, you log into the system and let's say that you perform a read operation on some files in uh, the Bank of America company data set. Now, the action of having read information in the Bank of America company data set would mean that your permissions would dynamically change for that specific uh, principle to no longer be able to read information in the Citibank company data set. Because if you could read data from both Bank of America and from Citibank, that could create 
conflict of interest scenario. So in other words, we are going to dynamically erect a Chinese wall in between uh, the two data sets in order to prevent a conflict of interest. Now, that's one of the rules that, in the way that the Chinese, mall, uh, Chinese wall model behaves. And so that if you've ever accessed data from company uh, data set one, um, if company data set two is in the same conflict of interest class, then you're not allowed to access data from co uh, company data set two anymore, not using that specific uh, user principle, so, which is going to be associated with a human being okay, who's going to be logging into a system and using subjects to interact with these objects. Now, it's perfectly plausible that there's another conflict of interest class, which remember is just another group of company data sets. And so over here we have financial services conflict of interest class, which includes Bank of America and Citibank. And over here, let's say we have another conflict of interest class, which is say, um, uh, say some technology companies. And so you have tech company A and tech company B. Now, the other component of uh, the Chinese wall is to make sure that we don't inadvertently allow data to, to leak through collusion between different users. So if you're allowed to view information in company data set one, which was in our example was Bank of America, that means that you're not allowed to view information in company data set two, which was Citibank because they're in the same conflict of interest class. You might, however, still be allowed to view information in one of the other conflict of interest classes, say tech company A, which is a company data set in conflict of interest class two. So you got Bank of America, tech company A. It's perfectly plausible that using a particular principle, you could go in and read data within company A and also read data in company B. Now, if you were to write to one of those other company data sets in a different conflict of interest class, it creates a potential for somebody in a different company data set within, say, the financial services conflict of interest class to be able to read that information that you wrote, thereby allowing it to effectively leak between the two company data sets in the uh, banking conflict of interest class. In order to avoid that, the other thing that the Chinese wall prevents is the ability that if you were to have, say, read access to Bank of America and read access to tech company A, and then you perform a write operation to tech company A, then you no longer have write capabilities to either one of the um, uh, company data sets. And so that's, that's another one of the rules that's built into how the Chinese model works. Okay? One of the single biggest things that can be tough to kind of say, well, how does this apply to real life, is the whole idea of dynamically changing permissions. Um, because most modern operating systems don't support that, to say that you're only allowed to open file one if you've never opened file two before. But as soon as you open you know, file two, then you can no longer open file one kind of a thing. So uh, that doesn't necessarily neatly fit into what most of us use every day as far as operating systems are concerned. But uh, that's just the quick gist of the Chinese wall model. It's, it's, I think it's one of the least often discussed and, and least well understood models as far as CISSP candidates are concerned because it doesn't get a lot of, um, a lot of detail in, in the study material that's out there. All right, let's go ahead and leave all that Chinese wall stuff behind us and move on to the next question, which says, which of the following items is going to uh, leave you with data remnants concerns uh, post deletion? There's your answer choices. I want you to go ahead and click on pause. And when you're ready, click play, and we can look at what the correct answers are. All right, first choice says that if you hold down the shift key and then delete to delete a file or a folder or the contents of a folder, um, that you're not gonna have any data remnants concerns. That's not true. The only thing that you're doing if you do that is if you hold down shift and delete is it in the Windows system is that you're gonna be skipping the recycle bin. Uh, you still absolutely have that data still on the disk just all of the references in the, in the uh, file system have been removed, but um, that data is still very much recoverable using uh, recovery tools. Second option says that if you format a hard drive before selling it on eBay, uh, no, you are still very much gonna have remnants concerns in that scenario because formatting doesn't actually remove any of the data. It just goes in and sort of you know, rewrites the uh, file system. And you sort of, if, if it was a book, you just kind of go in and rewrite the table of contents without actually changing any of the words that are in the actual printed pages that come next after it. So no, just formatting a drive and shipping it out for sale on eBay is a terrible idea. Um, and more than once that has led to people having information out there that they did not intend to be, have out there. Next option says that you can use a tool called DD um, to go in and overwrite a disk using random bits. And this is absolutely true. 
Uh, you don't need to go out and buy a fancy tool to do it. You can use DD, which is a freely available tool, to go in and say, I just want to write all zeros or all random bits to this drive, and it will go in and start at the beginning and write all the way to the very end, and will erase the data for all but the most motivated of, and in even most cases, even them, um, of attackers um, to be able to go in and get the data back. Next option says to use a um, crypto shredding technique. Crypto shredding um, is when you go in and encrypt all the data and then you delete the keys that are used to decrypt the data. Um, this is a very increasingly popular idea and when done well can be an effective way of going in and, and eliminating remnants concerns because even though the data is technically still there, it's encrypted and without the encryption keys, the likelihood of you getting it back ever, if not, sometime in the foreseeable future is really, 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 really tiny. So uh, the benefit is that it's a lot faster in most cases just going and encrypt the entire contents of a drive than it is to go in and try to say write random ones and zeros to it. Um, more often than not, people look at going and writing random ones and zeros to a drive and say, you know what, uh, I'd rather just melt this thing or put it through a giant shredder and turn it into little bits and chunks of metal uh, and then recycle that junk. That's a pretty effective way of getting rid of data. Um, if you don't want to go through all that, uh, you could just go in and encrypt the entire drive and then delete the keys that you use to do the encryption. And then your last answer choice on this question is to degauss. Uh, degaussing is when you apply a very strong magnetic field um, to a magnetic media, and that would be kind of important, um, and that will go in and securely erase the disk. Uh, and again, degaussing is, is going to go in and shift all those bits um, you know, off to one direction and effectively erasing it. So just to summarize here, the two correct answers are if you hold down the shift key while deleting a file and if you format the drive before selling it on eBay, both of those leave remnants concerns. The other techniques are uh, much more viable towards you not having remnants concerns left over. All right, two more questions down. I appreciate you being here. Um, if you like these questions and you find them helpful for you as you continue your studies, please click on the like button below. And I will also be extremely grateful if you would go ahead and subscribe because that way uh, you're going to go in and get these questions every single day because I do them every day or at least every weekday. And on that note, I'll see you tomorrow.